Welcome back once again, gang. Welcome to your lecture series for chapter 12 in your textbook, Give Me Liberty by Dr. Eric Foner. This chapter is entitled The Age of Reform, 1820 to 1840. Hello again, gang. Welcome to part three of our chapter nine lecture series. This section is entitled The Free Individual. The focus question for this section is how did the meanings of American freedom change in this period? The ever-increasing emphasis on Western expansion and settlement during this period led to the creation of an idea known as Manifest Destiny. This was a concept created by journalist John O'Sullivan in 1845 that basically posited that the United States had a divinely appointed mission to occupy all of North America. And those that stood in the way of American expansion were viewed as obstacles to the progress of American freedom itself. As we have discussed time and again throughout this course thus far, going back to the colonial period, the West offered the chance for Americans to achieve economic independence, what would later be termed the American Dream. Western expansion offered the chance for especially immigrants to escape the fixed social classes and large numbers of low-wage earning poor in Europe. There was nowhere to go in Europe. There was no frontier, no safety valve in which to release those social and economic tensions. So much of Europe was mired in this fixed status, especially when it came to economic equality and class status. Western expansion also was an escape valve for Americans from those low-wage factory jobs in the East, in those growing industrial hubs, particularly in New England. Gradually, over time, this sense of physical mobility itself, the ability to pick oneself up or one's family and move to a new area where economic opportunity might be greater, became a central component to the concept of American freedom itself. The first half of the 19th century also saw the rise of the first truly American philosophical movement, a movement known as Transcendentalism. The identity of American freedom came to mean an absence of restraints on self-directed individuals seeking economic advancement and personal development. And this idea was born out of this philosophy of transcendentalism. Transcendentalists insisted on the primacy of individual judgment over existing social traditions and institutions. Americans increasingly came to understand the realm of the self, which came to be called privacy, as one in which neither other individuals nor the government had a right to intervene. They believe that divinity pervades all nature and humanity. That divinity was not separate from nature and humanity as typical Christian theology put forth was that, but rather it was a part of this bigger whole, this divinity that enveloped all, if you will. They believed in the inherent goodness of the individual and the importance of the individual. They believed that society itself corrupts the individual and that people are at their best when they are self-reliant and independent. They also believed that before any social reforms could be undertaken, individuals must first reform themselves from both a moral, ethical, and intellectual level. 
The two biggest names in this transcendentalist movement were Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau. Emerson was pretty much the de facto leader of the transcendentalists. His writings really established the, the basis for the philosophy, and he really pushed to reform the American mind around these concepts of the individual and the importance of individual expression and self-reliance. Thoreau, for his part, was very wary of the growing commercialization of society, and his writings, especially his book, his book Walden, stressed a simpler lifestyle and a rejection of the market revolution. And transcendentalists like Thoreau were also very attached to nature and saw the preservation of nature as just as fundamentally important as the advancement of the individual in American society. So in many ways, guys like Thoreau perhaps can be seen as the first environmentalists. They were the first ones to really kind of identify nature as something to be preserved and protected. The first half of the 19th century also saw a phenomenon known as the Second Great Awakening. And much like the First Great Awakening in the 18th century, this featured an explosion of popular religious revivals throughout the United States. The Second Great Awakening added a religious dimension to the growing celebration of self-improvement, self-reliance, and self-determination that was emerging from that transcendentalist philosophy that was penetrating American society at this time as well. The Second Great Awakening further democratized American Christianity. Church attendance boomed, and there was a growth and further pluralization of Protestant denominations, particularly Methodists and Baptists, which saw an in substantially exponential explosion in this time. Because of the Second Great Awakening, it re-entrenched Christian values and Christian morals in American society, and Christianity became even more central to American culture than it had even previously been. Sort of piggybacking on the transcendentalist philosophy and its stress on individualism, the Great Awakening, or the Second Great Awakening, if you will, stressed the right of private judgment in spiritual matters. It was up to each individual to judge for themselves what was truth and what was not when it came to spirituality and religion. Now, while the Great Awakening used the improved transportation that developed around the market revolution to spread its message, at the same time, the ministers associated with the Second Great Awakening railed against the growing greed and selfishness inspired by the market revolution. So there's this you know, stark irony there between this movement using the tools that were developed by the market revolution to condemn that very market revolution itself. Now, the Second Great Awakening and the, the evangelical ministers associated with it were supportive in general of the transcendentalist emphasis on the individual. However, they were wary on that getting too far out of control. Uh, much like the elites during the late uh, 18th century were wary of democracy going out of control. They felt it could lead to too much anarchy and not enough stability in society. So, the Second Great Awakening ministers generally advocated for a controlled individualism with a 
with an emphasis on hard work, sobriety, and self-discipline as the essence of freedom. Alright gang, that does it for part 3 of our chapter 9 lecture series. As always, study hard, and I'll see you soon.